As a kid, I, I loved to play with gadgets. I'd build model airplanes. I'd fuss with a little electrical stuff. But I loved comic books. And one day I was reading a Superman comic book. I was probably age six or so. And in the centerfold was not a comic, but it was a text description of how to build something called a crystal radio. And as I read it, I realized I could build this out of parts that I could find around my home. And didn't have any money. I couldn't afford to buy anything. So I said, all you need is your father's old razor blade, a piece of pencil lead, an empty toilet paper roll, some wire which you, I could find lying around, an ear phone, which I stole from the candy store's telephone booth. You could unscrew them and take it. And you needed a variable capacitor. Now, I had no idea what that was. So I knew for that, I'd have to get down to Canal Street in New York City. I was raised in Manhattan. I'd have to buy that. So my mother took me down in the subway, went to Canal Street. I proudly walked up to the first store that sold electronics parts. I banged my fist on the table and said, I want a variable capacitor. And the proprietor said, what size? And I had no idea. He blew my cover. So I had to confess. I had no idea. I told him what I wanted to do. He said, I know just what you need. He gave me this variable capacitor. I took it home. I wired it up. And I heard music. No batteries. Almost no cost. Out of junk that I could find around. And I said, what is this? This is magic. And so I decided to find out what it was all about. And I spent the rest of my life <laughs> pursuing the electronics, understanding the radio waves, communications, and all the rest. So it was, it's amazing that the comic book led me to this life I now lead. Anyway, it was, it was an inspiring experience because it was, it was great to be able to just do it on your own with, 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 with no help, with no big stuff. I never became a ham radio operator because I couldn't afford the rig. I couldn't afford an ammeter or a voltmeter. I would get old radios from neighbors and, and stores going out of business, cannibalize them and make new ones out of it. It was, I'd go down to Canal Street and out on the sidewalk there'd be a cardboard box with dusty old vacuum tubes. And it said, five cents guaranteed to light. Well, they would light, but they wouldn't necessarily amplify. <laughs> so I had a lot of fun figuring out what was wrong with the parts I was putting together. Anyway, it, it was a wonderful experience. And from there, I went to a Bronx High School of Science, pushed my engineering some more, and then went to City College at night, got my electrical engineering degree, then MIT, and then I did my graduate work there. And I was surrounded by computers at MIT. I was also working at MIT Lincoln Laboratories, where some of the best computers in the world were being developed. And I said, you know, sooner or later, these machines are going to have to talk to each other. And there was no effective way for them to do that. So that was the, basically the topic of my dissertation, to find effective and efficient ways for computers to communicate. Now, the only way they could do it at that time was using the network of the time called the telephone network. And the largest telephone network carrier at the time was AT&T. The technology they used at the time was something called circuit switching, which is pretty much what they still use today. <coughs> when you and I communicate on a telephone, we have a connection that's dedicated to our conversation. And if I pause, take a cup of coffee, go for a break, and don't hang up the phone, that connection is still being used for us even though there's silence on the link. In fact, with a speech conversation, approximately one-third of the time is silence. But that's okay. It's not dramatically bad. If you're sending data over a communications link, you're probably sending data one one-thousandth of the time. Just imagine yourself sitting at a keyboard going click, click, click on a high-speed line. So the line sees bip, and it waits an eternity, another bip. It's being wasted most of the time. So we needed a way in which we could let other people use that communications link when we're not. And I call that resource sharing. We're going to share these resources on a demand basis. When I've got something to send, fine, the system will send it. When I have nothing, other people can use it. Constantly assigning people to gain access. Now, there are many ways to do that. And one of the ways to do that is called packet switching. 
where you take a message, you chop it up into little pieces called packets, and each packet finds its way through the network in a highly distributed and opportunistic fashion. Now, how does it do that? Well, the network has to be very clever and understand which is the best way to send the packet that just came into me now. It's got to sense the conditions of the network. So it was very clear to me early on that if I'm going to build a network which would be work in a large environment, thousands, millions of nodes like we have today, billions, there can't be a centralized point of control. Nothing can be control of everything because that's a point of failure. It'll be overloaded. It's a bad idea. You have to distribute the functionality. And so the idea of introducing distributed control, everybody shares in the control of the network. And the idea of sharing all the resources was key to making this work. So I decided, I, I developed this thing called packet switching. I wrote the first paper on it, published the first book on it. And what happened is, as I was doing this research, I was uncovering the principles of this resource sharing on a demand basis. And one lovely principle that came out was, the larger the system, which means the more capacity, the more traffic, the more users, the more efficient the system works. That was a surprise result, actually. So for every reason, this idea of sharing resources was key. So I developed that for my PhD dissertation. Here is a copy of my PhD dissertation proposal. It was submitted in basically in May and accepted in July of 1961. And the title is Information Flow in Large Communication Networks. As I mentioned earlier, I wanted to discuss large systems, and therefore we needed distributed control and resource sharing. And after a couple of years of work, here is a copy of my PhD dissertation. The title changed to be called Message Delay in Communication Nets with Storage. And here we see there's a mathematical development of the underlying theory of packet switching as well as simulation results that showed the performance of this network. It was decided by McGraw Hill at MIT to write it, make it into a book, so in 64 it became a book. And the whole theory was laying out there. Now, I went to at and and I said, look, why don't you people implement this concept, this mathematical theory I've developed? Not only did I analyze it, I could s optimize it tell them the best way to do it, AT and said, it's not going to work. Won't work. And if it does work, we want nothing to do with it. Around the same time, there were these very large computer conferences. And we'd have these plenary sessions with 10,000 people in the audience and a panel of computer guys and telephone guys. And we would start out by saying, would you please give us good data communications? And these telephone guys would say, look, the United States is a copper mine. It's full of copper wires called telephone lines. Use that. And I would say, no, no, you don't understand. It takes you 35 seconds to dial up a call. You charge me a minimum of a three-minute call. And I want to send a hundredth of a second of data. And their response was, little boy, go away. For the same reason that they said this won't work, we've got nothing to do with it. There was no revenue in data communications. There was no data to be, to be sent. So in the short term, they were correct. It was not a revenue stream. In the long term, it was a dramatic and drastic short-sighted failure on their part. Eventually, this idea of packet switching has come to eat their lunch. They've had to totally convert over to packet switching. So the net result in answer to your question, this long answer is, that in 19... 59, 60, 61, 62, I developed this theory which developed the idea of packet switching and later in the 60s there turned out to be a need for it. So while I was doing this work in the period from 59 to 62, there was another thread what I'll call the ARPA thread, the Advanced Research Projects Agency. And the history there is, as you may well remember, in 1957, the Russians launched Sputnik, the first satellite. 
And they caught the United States with its pants down. And President Eisenhower at that point said, this will never happen to us again. And he created what is called the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, to fund research in advanced technology and science. And so they started funding. And among the other things they funded was computer research. In 1963, the, the Information Processing Techniques Office, namely computer research, was formed. And the first director of that office was a fellow named Licklider. Lick Licklider. And he was envisioning at that time the concept of what he called a galactic network, whereby there'd be an enormous amount of man-computer symbiosis. You give some great computing capability with a good interface and put humans in front of it, and there'll be a terrific growth of ideas and, and functionality. So he, he was conceiving of this network, but he had no idea how to make it. He was also an MIT professor. He had no idea that I had already developed a theory. I had no idea that he was envisioning its application. It was around that time we met, and around that time that ARPA began thinking about the need for a network. And through a sequence of directors, following him was another classmate of mine named Ivan Sutherland. Following him was a fellow named uh, Bob Taylor. And Bob Taylor at ARPA recognized that he was funding research all over the country. And in order to gain access to each of the computer centers he was funding, he needed a different terminal to log on to their time-sharing system. And he said, too many terminals. Let's make it simpler and give me just one terminal that can talk to some kind of a common infrastructure, namely a network. So the idea was, let's create a network, not only for access from Washington, D.C., where ARPA was based, but so that the researchers could communicate. Example, ARPA is funding a researcher, many researchers. Each one of them takes the good and forward-looking funding that ARPA gave them and creates a wonderful facility. At UCLA, we created great simulation capability. At SRI, database. At University of Utah, graphics. At University of Illinois, high-performance computing. So each time they came to a new researcher, he would say, fine, I'll do research for you. Give me some money. Buy me a computer, and ARPA said, fine, we'll do that. But also, I want all the capability that's already out there. I want good simulation, good graphics, good database, high performance. And ARPA said, whoa, wait a minute. We can't afford to give everybody everything. However, what we can do is put you in a network. You want to do graphics, you log on to the machine in Utah. You want to do simulation, you log on to the machine at UCLA and run the application at that site instead of yours. And so these were the motivations for needing a network by which all of this communication interaction could take place. And so they decided to build this network. And they brought to ARPA another one of my classmates named Larry Roberts. And he was put in charge of making this happen. Now he and I were not only classmates at MIT, but office mates. And he was very well aware of what I was doing. You know, we'd discuss each other's research all the time. And so he recognized that the technology that would allow us to implement this network was the, the packet switching technology I had developed. And in fact, if you look on the web, I can show you where he says, he would never have committed this country to spend millions of dollars building a network if he hadn't known that I had proven it would work and that the packets wouldn't fall on the floor or overflow. So, he took on the job. He brought a bu bunch of us together in 1967 to specify what this network should look like. We put out a request for proposal, request for quote, actually. Proposals and quotes came in. And at the very end of 68, just around Christmas time, the award was given to a Cambridge-based company, Cambridge, Massachusetts, a company called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman. They were given the spec, and the job was for them to implement the spec by creating a switch which would carry out all of the communications functions, all the packet switching functions, which would attach to a host. By the way, the gentleman who decided to separate that functionality instead of embedding it in the host computer, but to make a separate switch, which we now call routers, was a fellow named Wes Clark. He was working at, at MIT Lincoln Laboratory with a bunch of us. Brilliant guy. So the spec was there, BBM was given a job in January of 69, 
they were told, go ahead and do it, and deliver the first node to UCLA by sep early September 69. Now, UCLA was chosen because I was here. I came to UCLA in 1963. I knew what the technology was, and we were going to become, and we did become, the network measurement center. So as the network began to grow, we could test it, stress it, try to break it, and we could, and therefore learn from the early network what the changes should be. Well, on, on the Labor Day weekend of, of 1969, that switch arrived. The switch is called an interface message processor. I'll be happy to show it to you. It's right next door. It's the size of a telephone booth. And on September 2nd, the Tuesday after Labor Day, we connected that switch, that imp, to our time-sharing computer serving the computer science department here at UCLA, connected them, and immediately bits began to flow back and forth. Next day we had messages and flowing back and forth. It was a magnificent success. You know, I'm often asked, did I anticipate what was going to happen? And if you ask many of the people back then, many of them will say, oh sure, I saw this all coming. When you ask me, I'll say yes and no. And the yes part, I've got proof. A press release was put out two months before the September 2nd event, in which I'm quoted as in saying what I see this is going to become. And I did anticipate that this internet would be everywhere, always on, always accessible, anybody with any device could attach it any time, and it would be invisible, just like electricity is invisible. But what I did not anticipate was that my elderly mother would be on the internet, and she wasn't until she passed away last year at age 99. I didn't realize it would reach billions of people, would have political impact, certainly you know, education, commercial, scientific, yes, but some of the social networking, you know, the history of the Internet has been one of surprises. The best applications, nobody anticipated. Email, nobody saw it coming. The web, YouTube, peer-to-peer, -peer, Napster, for example. They came out, and within months, they were dominating the network. And they came out of the blue, hit us all in the side of the head. That's the beauty of the Internet. You've got billions of people out there inventing, creating, and sharing. And some of those ideas are good, and they catch on, and organically they grow. It's, it's, it, it's, it's an amazing story.